know me, my name is Dr. Debbie Sigerson and I'm a technical service veterinarian for Purina Pro Plan Veterinary Diets. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to sponsor the CE event. I've been to several of these um, over the last couple of years and I always find them to be very, very, very useful. And I suspect the same will be here as well. For those of you that are interested, we're not going to go over any product or any information. Some of you may be familiar that we have a diet that may be beneficial in some patients that have epilepsy as well as in some patients that have cognitive dysfunction syndrome. Um, there is information in the bags, um, and if you're interested, you're welcome to contact or speak to me after the presentation or Andrea Good, who is the territory manager in this region. So I'll um, take the opportunity now to introduce you to Dr. Fiona James. Um, Dr. James is, oops, has <laughs> earned a master's degree in, in neuroscience from the University of Western Ontario before completing her doctor of veterinary medicine degree at Ontario Veterinary College. After an internship in Michigan, she returned to OBC for both a residency in neurology and a doctor of veterinary science degree. From 2009 to 2011, she was an adjunct faculty here at OVC, and following that, she went into private practice. She rejoined the neurology service in 2011. Her research interests, particularly useful for this topic, include comparative epilepsy, canine epilepsy, EEGs, and translational genetics and neurologic diseases. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James here tonight. Thank you to everyone who's here in person and to those of you who are tuning in uh, via the internet tonight. Uh, and thank you again to our sponsors uh, for this lovely evening and the meal that you are having. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here to update you on uh, some recent uh, consensuses in uh, small animal epilepsy. And I'm going to uh, start by introducing you to our neurology service. Uh, across the top, we have uh, Dr. Luis Gaitiro, um, Jen Collins, our stalwart tech who runs the service, really, uh, myself. Um, and then along the bottom, from uh, left to right, our senior resident, Dr. Thomas Parmentier, our second year resident, Dr. Edouard Marshall, our first year resident, uh, Dr. Michal Hasenfratz, and our neurology specialty intern, Dr. Sabrina Martins. You'll see all of our names on the discharge statements that we send out to you. Uh, and I'm sure you'll be talking to uh, various members of our team we're very pleased this is the biggest the neurology service has been uh, and very excited to have uh, such a strong team moving forward. The goals of the talk tonight are to cover um, certain uh, points with you that have uh, been outlined in the last couple of years. Uh, breeds, specific epilepsy, treatment, uh, diagnostics, and above all, terminology. And I say that because as professionals, we're all speaking a language together. And it helps if we're all using similar terminology to approach the same disease. Uh, that way we can understand each other. However, I will hang all of this on cases because I think that's ultimately what we all do um, and our common uh, uh, purpose here tonight. The consensus proposals I refer to come from two august bodies. Uh, there is the uh, ACVIM Small Animal Consensus Statement on Seizure Management in Dogs, published in late 2015, uh, and also the uh, International Veterinary Epilepsy Task Force, uh, which is a fairly large mouthful, um, that published several uh, consensus proposals on various topics, uh, and these will be updated regularly throughout uh, the next few years uh, as findings come out. The really cool thing about all of these is that they are open source. And in the handout that was provided tonight, I've uh, tried to summarize this for you so you don't have to go wading through a half dozen fairly thick documents. So the biggest case to talk about, the most basic case uh, I will start with, and that was a three month old male intact Mastiff cross puppy who presented with an acute onset of seizures 48 hours previously. The episodes had been happening every three to six hours. He'd had two rounds of vaccine, he was on a kibble diet, uh, and this is what he was doing. That was my resident leaving the room to fetch some medications. 
And prior to this, he'd been sitting on my lap. I'd been sitting on the floor with him. He got up, ran across the room, and started doing this. I'd missed maybe five seconds of me fishing out my phone and sending the resident to the ICU for some diazepam. And we've all seen this. This is not a surprise. It's fairly typical. I'm going to point out some things. We have a fairly rigid body. The dog, I'm talking to him while I'm videotaping, and he's not responding. He's, he's glazed in his look. I'd like to point out that the twitches are happening on both sides of his face at the same time. Very rigid posture. Is he conscious? Well, it's a matter of debate. He's certainly not in lateral recumbency, but he's definitely not aware of what's going on. It's that foaming at the mouth. His history, the 48 hours history, had been of um, drooling, episodic drooling. Um, and they thought he was maybe nauseous and uh, a little vomity. But once he did this in front of me, I realized what was going on. And it was only the one episode prior to this that he'd actually started, he'd actually continued past this frothing stage. It goes on for a while, doesn't it? It takes about a minute and a half to get down to the ICU, find some diazepam and get back. And that's still going on. <laughs> so still very tonic, but you're starting to see some limb movement. See that? And when the fleece appears and we jump on him, that's when the diazepam reappears. <laughs> it's the longest two minute video when you're forced to sit there and watch it. And for owners, this is devastating. Like, subjectively, this is 15 minutes, 20 minutes. How long was it? It took forever. <laughs> and we're just waiting for the diazepam to get back. I mean, this is like 200 meters max sprint to the ICU and back. And here comes the clonic part. Any second now. Here we go. And I will point out that at this point he releases his sphincters. And you can see it on the floor there behind him. And about diazepam comes in the door. OK? Despite having seen that numerous times, it's still, it's still a like, heart-stopping moment to watch. So, seizure. What is a seizure? It's a transient occurrence of signs and or symptoms due to abnormal, synchronous neural activity in the brain. Let me highlight for you just how abnormal that is, okay? If you think of your brain, to borrow an analogy from a textbook and run with it, if you think of your brain, or a brain, as a sports stadium full of people, okay? All of those people are the neurons. Think what kind of event it would take to get an entire sports stadium of neurons saying the same thing at once, okay? It takes a goal, and even then, only members of that team are going to cheer goal, <laughs> okay? Um, like, that, that's the kind of special event it takes to get a seizure in the brain, okay? Sure, there's always that drunken quadrant of frat boys trying to get a chant going, but that's a little focus, okay? For that focus to take off and get the whole stadium saying the same word is really rare, okay? I'm going to use this analogy throughout the rest of the talk because I really find it very helpful in understanding what's going on. A generalized seizure is one that originates in and engages a network that is bilateral, both hemispheres. This has several impacts on what you will see on the outside. It doesn't necessarily involve the entire cortex, okay? The onset, so the location and lateralization you will see is not necessarily consistent. Today like this, next day like this, okay? So this is where your description that you elicit from an owner is really, really helpful and also not very helpful because most people don't observe these things. And the video that you will get, possibly helpful, but also not very helpful because that first 10 seconds is you fumbling or the owner fumbling for the video camera and you miss that onset. And it can be asymmetric. 
And they don't always have to be lateral on the floor. I'm just going to point that out. They don't always have to be lateral on the floor. That's the classic one. The, 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 the end of that puppy's seizure that you saw, that's classic. But the onset of him backing up, he's still conscious. He's able to do a fairly complex movement there, but that is still seizure at that point. There's a lot of terminology used in describing a seizure. I use some of it in the video, but I just want to go over some of it with you now. So for a generalized onset, we classify by the amount of movement and what we're seeing. And the motor manifestations can be tonic, that rigidity, followed by the clonic, the movement. Okay? If it's just clonic, then you can say that. If it's just tonic, you can say that. If it's tonic, then clonic, say tonic, then clonic. There's myoclonic, which are tiny little muscle fas fasciculations. Arguably with that puppy, you could say myoclonic, tonic, clonic. <laughs> <laughs> because it started with the little jaw chatterings and then moved into rigidity and then went into paddling. Um, and then there is atonic, those drop attacks. They suddenly go limp and come back up again. Okay, that, that's an atonic movement. And then um, there are some other things I'm going to mention. This is borrowed, by the way, this uh, diagram from the wonderful world of human epileptology where <laughs> Their governing body has the excellent name, most excellent name, of the International League Against Epilepsy. It sounds so medieval and it's awesome. Um, and they do wonderful work. And we are, we are trying to get our terminology in veterinary medicine to match their terminology as best we can so that we, when we talk to you know, our human counterparts, they're like, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. That, we have something similar. Um, and so that's why there's this, this uh, rush of consensus statements in the last couple of years, and you will see more coming out, and I'll probably do this again. Um, and then I'm going to point out that a lot of the similar words are used under the focal column, okay? The differences um, come down to awareness um, and impaired awareness, which in humans they really try to understand. Is, is, is the awareness affected at all? Bear in mind, humans can have focal seizures without an alteration in awareness, um, or is their awareness impaired? Um, and then, of course, emotional, sensory, that kind of thing. So, with our puppy here, we agree. We have generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Although, like I said, if you want to split hairs, we can say myoclonic, tonic-clonic. And... I want to just highlight one other thing in the evolution of our terminology here is that we're trying not to use words like grand mal or petit mal anymore, okay? They've come up through primary generalized and simple or complex partial to now where we are of saying generalized or focal epileptic seizure, okay? Um, with modifiers as I've shown you. So. For veterinary medicine, semiology is still semiology is still our main definition of a seizure. And semiology is the fancy word for the outward manifestations. What is the animal doing? And that still pretty much clinically defines our seizures and epilepsy. I'm going to later talk about a more elegant way to do that. Uh, but for now, this is practically what we've got. A seizure is a sudden short transient event, like I defined, getting all the neurons to say the same thing at once. But it doesn't always equal an epileptic event. An epileptic seizure um, is that neural activity um, with convulsions, focal motor, autonomic behavioral uh, features that's usually transient. A reactive seizure is not necessarily an epileptic seizure. Okay? This is one where it's triggered by something. Metabolic, toxic, biting the electrical cord of your computer. Um, you know, those things should pass once they get over what it was that triggered it. Okay? These are not necessarily epileptic seizures. So I just want to make that clear. Um, and it should go away. Reactive seizures will go away when you rectify the problem underlying them. Epilepsy, however, is a brain disease. And that is a predisposition to having epileptic seizures. And we need at least two before we're going to even consider this as a diagnosis, okay? For the classification of epilepsy, we have three categories. Idiopathic, it's the same we've always known, which we pretty much have either proved to be genetic or suspect to be genetic because all border collies have it, for example, um, or we suspect is genetic but really don't know because it's not been reported in that breed, etc. okay? Structural epilepsy, where they have brain pathology, 
and unknown, which really is idiopathic because we've looked and can't find a cause, but it should have some sort of cause and we don't really know what it is yet. Does that make sense? Three categories. In the handout for you and in these um, open source papers, there are some excellent tables which are good to refer to. Um, and they list th useful things like the age of seizure onset in many of the breed specific epilepsies. Um, so very helpful. <coughs> Typically though you're looking at an onset around 6 to 12 months. Okay? Um, not for all breeds, I'm just saying typically. The other thing that's really handy in this uh, paper is the seizure type and their remission rate as far as we know. So for example here, Australian Shepherds, 36% have generalized epileptic seizures and 12% might actually go into remission. Okay, so a useful table to which you can consult um, and give information to your owners when they're presenting with a genetic epileptic dog. So coming back to our puppy, he's three months old, so he's a bit young for that classic window of idiopathic epilepsy. So I have to put structural on the list. Okay, his neurologic exam is normal between seizures, other than a delayed return of menace bilaterally, okay? And uh, we're going to look now at what can we do to diagnose this. So diagnostic criteria, very simple first question. Is it having epileptic seizures? And if it is, what is the cause? Is it reactive, structural, or idiopathic? Things to think about. How do we do this? Well, the same straightforward approach we've always had. No, no change there. Physical exam, neurologic exam, I strongly recommend you do the whole exam. And now, to wake you up from the postprandial slumber, what four tests as part of the neurologic exam are specific to the thalamocortex? I'm going to ask you to answer. <laughs> Anyone? Any volunteers? I'll shut my eyes. No? Menace. Okay, menace response. There's another response we look at. Nasal septum. Yep, nasal septum. Okay. Anything with reflex in the name of it is not a re thalamocortical response, so just disregard those. So your postural reactions. Okay. And then the final one is mentation, their personality, their awareness, their mental interaction with the world. So at the very least do those four, but ideally do the whole exam. And if you find absolutely nothing, you've got a couple of options. One is that this is genetic or idiopathic epilepsy, and the other is that this is early cancer, because our neurologic exam is crude at best, we don't ask them who the current Prime Minister of Canada is and what day of the week it is. So subtle things, if they're slurring their bark, we're kind of stuck. Okay? So, so there's some things we're not going to pick up. Uh, if there are deficits, your decision tree will be postictal, drugs, so what did you just give it, <laughs> and uh, possibly structural epilepsy. Postictal deficits should go away in seven days. So you can always double check. Time is a cheap MRI. Right, so minimum database, CBC, biochem, ah, biochem, routine biochem. We look at that every day. Five tests of liver function on the routine biochem panel. Full, the full one. What are they? I hear someone mentioning some liver enzymes like ALT. These are leakage. You've got to pop a cell or two to get there. Not function. Bile acids, excellent, yes. Not on a routine panel unless your lab's doing something more for you than mine is. Albumin, yes. Okay, acute re phase protein. It's going to drop. One of the first signs you've got of liver dysfunction is loss of albumin. Absolutely, yes. Glucose, one of the last things to go. Gluconeogenesis is a huge liver function. And when they stop making glucose, you're kind of hooped. Something in between. Urea, absolutely, conversion of ammonia to urea, or not. 
Two more. Something your liver is doing right now. Packaging up all those lovely fats with cholesterol. Okay, so cholesterol and the other thing, not bile acids, but bilirubins. Okay, so those are your five functional tests of liver uh, on a routine biochem panel. And of course, it's always good to check lights because weird lights can give you weird things neurologically. And then, of course, your analysis. Now, going one step further, there is a discretionary database. And this is what you would run if you have an index of suspicion that something's going wrong. So your classic thyroid, for example. Um, full thyroid panel to make sure, because I don't know about you, it's hard to call them back in to run the other, other items on the panel when you've got a weird T4, total T4. Uh, blood pressure. Um, always note machine, cuff, limb, recumbency, and do it three times, and then repeat it three times. Okay. Uh, ocular exam. It's the one cranial nerve we can look at. Love it. Okay. Ophthalmology would be proud of me today. Um, and then we mentioned ammonia and pre and post prandial bile acids. Any suspicion of liver dysfunction, you probably want to run those as well. Going onwards, diabetes you can check for, um, pheochromocytomas, um, insulinomas, uh, toxicology, titers, PCR for infectious uh, diseases, if, especially if they've been traveling. We are in a fairly privileged part of the world here, north of the 401. Um, but once you start heading south, weird things happen. Um, Met check, um, so three view chest, abdominal ultrasound, all of these at your discretion with any suspicion whatsoever. Then we get into the advanced database, the big toys. MRI versus CT, with MRI being the preferred option. It gives us visualization of the brain as if I took off the skull and looked at it with my own two eyes. It's beautiful. And that is the best soft tissue definition we have. Spinal tap and possibly biopsy. I used to say I would offer it and people would say no. I'm offering it and people are saying yes these days. Um, so that is a possibility as well. When do you perform an MRI? Um, the recommendations, uh, which I thoroughly agree with, are at epileptic, epileptic seizure onset less than six months or older than six years. That's the range inside of which classic idiopathic genetic epilepsy will occur. Uh, if you have an abnormal interictual neural exam, uh, status epilepticus or cluster seizures, and presumptive idiopathic epilepsy, but where you're having no luck managing it. Okay. There are equally good answers from low and high field MRI for most things. The one rec or the three recommendations rather for high field rather than low field. And this is referring to the size of the Tesla or T associated with the MRI. It's the, the size of the magnet strength offered. Higher magnet strengths allow better resolution. Um, and so high field is recommended for congenital or developmental abnormalities, so the cortical dysplasias, uh, infectious diseases where the changes can be quite subtle, um, so distemper or rabies, um, and metabolic diseases, again, where the changes could be quite subtle, so hepatic encephalopathy, thiamine deficiency, that kind of thing. And then there's a really cool thing that we're using now in the <coughs> neurology service, which many of you might have started to see on your discharge statements, and that is a confidence level in our diagnosis. How confident are we that we've got the right diagnosis? There's three tiers for this. Tier one is your normal minimum and discretionary database. Short answer, no imaging. Okay? It's your neuro exam, bl some blood work, plus or minus chest rads, that kind of thing where everything's normal, you probably wouldn't find much if you kept going up the tier levels, but we acknowledge that it is not a full investigation and we call it tier one. Tier two includes advanced imaging. Okay, we have scanned the brain and in this idiopathic epileptic, we could see nothing wrong with its brain at our field strength, okay, our, our magnet field strength. And then tier three is all of the above, including an EEG an electroencephalogram, and I'll define that for you in a little bit. So back to our case, our little puppy, we did a CBC Chem UA, they were all within normal limits. Ammonia, the first time we drew it was fairly high, but when we repeated it, it was normal, and the abdominal ultrasound picked up nothing. 
uh, and CSF was in with, within normal limits. And that's as far as our client could go financially. And that's okay. Because at recheck over a week later, the puppy's neuro, neural exam, neuro, the neuro exam was normal. That menace had returned. Okay? Again, postictal deficits can last for a week. So this was a tier one diagnosis of idiopathic or genetic epilepsy, um, as far as we could tell. And he's potentially starting young, or we've missed something. There is something on the MRI that we haven't done, and structural is the, is the cause, only we're not going to see it because they can't scan him. Fair enough, okay? So then we talk about treatment. What are we going to do for this puppy? The recommendations to start treatment are when there is structural epilepsy um, or earlier brain pathology. So say he was dropped on his head at birth, then this would be a good time to start seizure, uh, seizure meds. Um, status epilepticus, anything lasting more than five minutes, I will talk about that later, or cluster seizures, any three or more in 24 hours. Um, two or more seizures in say roughly six months. Um, prolonged severe or unusual postictal periods. There's a flow sheet in the, in the uh, uh, consensus proposal. Um, but what's interesting, I'm going to point out to you, is the primary goal is seizure freedom. Okay? I don't see any of those cases. You're not going to send them to me if you achieve seizure freedom. So the secondary goals are prevention of cluster or status, reduction in seizure frequency or uh, severity. Um, and uh, if you look at what drug companies have to test, they're looking at a 50% reduction in seizure frequency, pre and post intervention. Okay? And that's sort of more my world versus your world. Um, but I would really like to know at some point, and I may yet send a resident out to say hello to all, all of you in the next few years, how many of yours actually achieve seizure freedom? That would be really cool to know. And which anti-epileptic drug and when? So, there's a handy chart um, looking at the monotherapy recommendation. So, for the first drug, single drug, um, and it gives you the level of evidence to support that, the grade of recommendation, A being the best, C being the worst, and whether or not to monitor drug levels. I'm just going to remind you here that... Um, there we go. Levels of evidence, uh, highest one being a blinded, randomized, controlled trial. Lowest being expert opinion, hello. <laughs> okay, um, I recognize where I stand on this pyramid. Um, when do we monitor serum levels? Um, at steady state, after starting treatment or dose change. Uh, and that depends on the drug, and I have summaries for you here. Um, uncontrolled seizures despite apparently adequate dose. You think you're doing the right thing, but where's the drug going? Uh, signs of dose-related toxicity uh, and to check for pharmacokinetic drift. So usually every six to 12 months to check in on what's going on. Um, there are recommended numbers in the charts, but they're all American. So I've put in the Canadian versions. Um, so for phenobarb, we aim for 100 to 120. Okay, the range by labs is usually like 45 to 145 or 85 to 185. Really not very practical for 95% of dogs. Aim for 100 to 120. And for potassium bromide, uh, most labs have an upper cutoff of 20. I say you want to aim for 20 to 25. Under 20, I, at least the ones I see, isn't very effective. Okay? So that's a very practical thing. I don't have as much evidence for you as, um, that's, that's expert opinion. Yes? If they have a sub-therapeutic level, but they haven't been having any seizures, like that's awesome. Absolutely. If they're, so the question was, if their level is sub-therapeutic, so not in the range I've just given you, but they haven't had any seizures, run with it. Be, bear in mind that seizures may now come, and if they do, you probably you have good justification to amp up the level again at that point. Excellent. Risks of treatment. This is the cool thing about this paper as well. It goes through different types or severity of risk of these drugs and provides them for you. Uh, type 1 being predictable, related to pharmacokinetics, dose dependent. Um, type 2, idiosyncratic, so rare, potentially life-threatening. Type 3, cumulative, so the longer you use it, 
can be potentially life-threatening. And type 4, delayed, and immediate, uh, delayed so carcinogenic, teratogenic, and life-threatening. The good news is none of these drugs are type 4. I'm just going to point that out. Okay? None of them are type 4. And the ones that are type 3 uh, are no surprise. Phenobarb, just ignore primidone and imipitoin. They don't really ones we use in this area. Imipitoin hasn't made it out of Europe yet, and primidone is more of a human drug. Um, but I'm just going to point out that pheno and bromide do have cumulative dose effects, and you're aware of that. So five or six years abusing the liver will end up in a fairly expected result with pheno, for example. Um, and too much bromide um, can certainly cause bromism and um, intoxication of that nature as well. Um, but the others, uh, like I said, um, I don't have type 3, and Zoni, uh, as far as type 2, um, has idiosyncratic reactions that are extremely, extremely rare. So uh, I will touch on those again later. So phenobab, that's our workhorse. It has the highest level of recommendation uh, from both panels. Um, it is efficacious, it is cheap, it is Q12 hours, that's huge for many owners. Um, steady state in about three weeks, and by the way, that drops. The longer they've been on it, the faster they reach steady state after a dose change, okay, because the liver is becoming more and more efficient at removing it from the body. Um, and, uh, of course, all the side effects are so well known. PU, PD, polyphagia, and then the potential dose-related liver toxicity and the idiosyncratic bone marrow. Bromide, again, efficacious, cheap, uh, once a day dosing for the really poorly compliant owner. Um, for those who are, I don't like drugs, um, this is really just purified seawater. It's a salt. You add it to the diet. You've got to be careful with the other salt in the diet because, you know, you don't want to mix your salts. Um, and uh, really, you can just put it in their food as a dietary additive. It's amazing. Um, the... Uh, time frame here, uh, like I said, is longer, so I don't tend to use it in referral practice because when they're sent to me, they're in crisis. Uh, but for those of you who have a little bit more time on your hands to play with, these are good drugs to use, except in cats, fatal in about 50% of them. They stop being able to breathe so well, not so good. Just going to put that on the table. Um, of course, PUDP, PUPD, polyphagia, they get a bit stoned on this one. Um, but uh, as I explained to those who don't like drugs, um, it, it does alter the uh, membranes in the brain. They get a little bit stoned, they get a little bit hungry, um, get the munchies, uh, and they understand. Okay, levetiracetam. Uh, not as high a grade of recommendation. The, the first two were the workhorses. Uh, but this appears to have some evidence to support it so far, not a lot. It's expensive, okay? If those two were the Timmies of the anti-epileptic drug world, this is the extra shot Frappuccino double thingy whatever Starbucks, especially if you're buying the Q12 hours extended release version through Chiron <laughs> or Summit. Um, so it has to be obtained. It's not, not uh, regularly available here. Um, it has to be obtained through a compounding pharmacy, but you can actually get it in a Q12 dose for owners who like the um, absence of adverse effects and are willing to pay for it. Um, it is very rapidly uh, in the system, two to three days, dog and cat. Zonisamide. Okay, this is crossing the border up to see us, has not been approved by Health Canada yet, so you are, just like levetiracetam, completely off-label. Uh, so you have to get it through compounding pharmacies, and I want you to be aware that for most of the patients I've seen, they go a bit, little bit off their food in the first few days. Okay? Uh, some dogs, I have to half the dose and then bring them back up to it, um, and their appetite will return. There are idiosyncratic reactions, um, a hepatic necrosis, and a Fanconi syndrome that has been reported in a handful of dogs, given that thousands are on it, um, prescribed by my colleagues south of the border. Okay, so it's fairly popular amongst veterinary neurologists south of the border. Uh, also very rapid and otherwise minimal side effects, and it's Q12, so very helpful for compliance. For non-pharmacologic treatment, um, you will have clients who ask you, and so I will answer. Vagal nerve stimulation, uh, so far is a no. 
partly because the units are in the four digits, if not five digits, to acquire. Uh, partly because the canine vagal nerve is not quite wired up the same way as the human vagal nerve. Whoops, sorry, touching the mic. Um, and uh, partly because the evidence was based on six implanted items, which is not a very big end on which to make a decision. There is a study ongoing in the UK if your client is willing to fly their dog there. Uh, dietary, you'll have read about ketogenic diets um, that work very well in human children, not so much in our um, carnivorous and uh, mostly carnivorous omnivores. Um, however, uh, specifically looking at medium chain triglycerides, there is some evidence to support that. Um, and uh, uh, that is the basis for our sponsor's diet. Um, acupuncture, resounding no, not effective. Homeopathy, definitely no, not effective. Uh, and of course, the big question we're all facing these days, um, cannabidiol, medical marijuana. Um, there is no evidence of efficacy in dogs. There is unknown harm. There is an unknown dosage. Unknown half-life and pharmacokinetics, so I don't even know where to start dosing if I was to try about it, and it's not legal for us to prescribe as veterinarians in Canada. So I don't even have anything to offer the client who asks about it, except that there is in Colorado a study going on. Uh, so if they wish to fly their dog down to Colorado, they can participate in a study down there that is trying to answer these questions. Um, harm, benefit, dosage, etc. Okay? The main papers that have come out so far, other than anecdotal reports in individual human children, have been based in rat models. And we all know how well those are analogized from rats to humans or rats to dogs. So I, I really don't have any strong evidence one way or the other. And if that's what people want to play with, that's what people want to play with. Back to our case, uh, he was put on phenobarbital. And we saw him for a couple of rechecks. And then uh, his family vet managed him from about six months onwards, which was great. Didn't hear from him for quite some time until he was six when he was euthanized at his family vet. And they called. And they said, actually, he'd been doing great. He was euthanized because of pain in a limb that had been getting worse. And they were worried it was cancer. And they said, he was once, six years ago, an OVC patient, would you like to have a look at him now that he's gone? And we said yes. And very generously, they allowed us to have a look. And we showed, in fact, that his brain uh, was an idiopathic epileptic brain. So no lesions in there. And he'd lived fairly well with his epilepsy for six years and was euthanized for unrelated reasons. So that brings me to this point. One of the other consensus proposals uh, by this group has recommended um, how to uniformly trim brains of epileptics so that we are comparing the same neurons from epileptic to epileptic to epileptic. And this is awesome if we get those brains. And one of the most generous gifts a client can give us is the chance to look and learn from their pet, from their family member, after they've gone. And any OVC patient that has been here once upon a time can come back for a post for free. And Gateway and the other cremation companies will often help facilitate that so that the, the ashes can go back to that client. And you can learn and we can learn and that there is no value I can put, no dollar value I can put on that gift that they give us to learn from these patients. Ah, so case one. And there's a lot of information to unpack there. But there are some weaknesses in these consensus statements. They don't really get into generalized versus focal seizures very much. They don't really talk about things like absence seizures or absence epilepsy. Don't even touch non-convulsive status epilepticus. Um, and other than recommending EEG, don't talk about it much more than that. Allow me. Case number two, two and a half year old male neutered German Shepherd dog who presented with twitches increasing in frequency over the last year. Blink and you miss it. So 
So if you look at that carefully, the entire left side of his face and neck is just being very rapidly pulled to one side and released. So just a, a tonic, no, not tonic, myoclonic jerk to the, to the left. Just one half, okay? Very interesting, very repeatable. Notice how stereotypic that was. That is a focal seizure, okay? These originate in a network in one hemisphere, unilateral. And the ictal onset is consistent between seizures. They can propagate to the other hemisphere, and we would previously have called that secondarily generalized seizure, but now we would say focal to bilateral tonic-clonic, describing explicitly what that generalized seizure is. Does that make sense? Instead of just saying generalized, we'd say it would become bilateral tonic-clonic or bilateral myotonic tonic-clonic, uh, you know, whatever that combination of words I was talking about. Um, there may or may not be impairment of consciousness. And again, as I said before, you want to classify awareness. Okay, previously we said consciousness, now we say awareness. Tell you a story, I have a friend who has temporal lobe epilepsy. She wasn't diagnosed until she was in her early 20s. She, as far as she would knew, was having random panic attacks. She'd come over all cold and sweaty and anxious and grumpy, and externally her co-workers would say, oh, she's having a bad day. Except they then they started to wake her up in the middle of the night. And so she's like, I need help. And so she went, bounced around, psychologist, psychiatry, neurologist eventually, and eventually an EEG. Oh, they said, you've got temporal lobe epilepsy. These panic attacks, which they discovered after a sleep study, these panic attacks are your seizures. And so they're under control now. But she functioned, she worked through these seizures. And her, her colleagues had no idea she could have conversations with them, like polysyllabic words, okay? So where we teach, oh, if you can give them a treat during a seizure, it's not a seizure. I don't hold to that anymore, folks. And I'm starting to prove it with EEG, but I'll come back to that. So as I said, they can uh, propagate to involve the other hemisphere. And both generalized and focal seizures can occur in a cluster, so more than two seizures within 24 hours, also known as acute repetitive seizures. That German shepherd, that was one exam. <laughs> he just kept doing it, okay? Every few seconds. Technically, that's a cluster. I'm going to pause the German shepherd and introduce you to another little friend an eight-month-old male intact chihuahua who presented for four months of progressive hiccups. This is the home video. I think some of you might have seen this before. <laughs> he came in through our internal medicine service and they diligently investigated his GI for the cause of these hiccups. They found nothing. And so as we have a good working relationship together, they sought a neuroconsult because when in doubt, get a neuroconsult. His neuro exam was completely normal between these events. Didn't do any one of these in the hospital with us, of course. And so we said, well, there's an outside chance there could be seizures. Let's have a look. Uh, so we scanned him. He's one of the few chihuahuas I've ever scanned that didn't have hydrocephalus. And he also had a normal spinal tap. And so we were like, well, now what? Hiccups. So, I'm going to introduce another concept, absence seizures. These are generalized, so both hemispheres, seizures, that have a brief transient activity cessation and blanking that may or may not be accompanied by bilateral limb or perioral jerks. These are myoclonic twitches that you're seeing, okay? There are many things that are mistaken for seizures, and just for the record, I'll put them here, and I have been fooled, okay? So I, I, I think I, it's perfectly reasonable for everyone to be fooled. Syncope, cardio and I go back and forth on numerous cases. Narcolepsy cataplexy, rare, but really confusing for seizures. Neuromuscular, episodic neuromuscular weakness, okay? Um, so collapsing syndromes. Uh, 
behavioral disorders, compulsive behavioral disorders. Um, so I've bounced cases back and forth with Gary Landsberg, for example. Um, vestibular attacks can be transient uh, and recover fairly rapidly. Uh, if there is nystagmus, don't think seizure, okay? Typewriter eyes, I keep asking the owners, but that's not going to help me in a few more years. Um, and then things like idiopathic head tremor, we're still arguing about whether those are seizures or not. And just to make you even more comfortable with the no idea category, there was a study done where they took 100 videos off of YouTube of episodic animal things, uh, dogs and cats, and they put it in front of 10 neurology diplomats and five GPs. And they asked them two questions. Is this an epileptic seizure? And if it isn't, what is it? And other than generalized tonic-clonic seizures, the case that I started with, once you remove those, the agreement was absolute crap. 10 dips, five GPs, no agreement as to what was going on in the videos. Okay, that keeps us all fairly humble. So going back to our diagnostic criteria, I showed you this earlier. If the first question is, is it having a seizure, an epileptic seizure? It's actually a very tricky question to answer if it's not a generalized tonic-clonic. So we get back to, like I said, a good description of how these things start. Is it consistent? Is it unilateral between events? You can try and get a video. And there is a standardized questionnaire um, that is attached to one of these consensus proposals um, that you could use to try and help you figure this out. You try and look at awareness, interictual mentation, personality, has that changed? Duration and frequency, time of day, seizures are more likely to occur when they're drowsy. So back to that stadium analogy, that bunch of raucous frat boys are, is going to get the cheer going around the crowd when the stadium is quiet, right? It's a lot easier for that, okay, I'll, I'll stand up and do the, uh, okay, <laughs> you know? Because they're, they're, paying, they're not staring at what's going on in the field, it's easier for that to take over. Um, but to actually define whether a seizure is occurring, you need an EEG. And this is the analogy of lowering microphones into that stadium, okay? If I put one microphone in, I will only hear when all the neurons say one word at the same time. So one microphone, the whole stadium would pretty much have to say, go, and then I'll hear that word. I'll pick it up with the microphone. The more microphones I have lowered into the roof of that stadium, the more resolution I can pick up from different quadrants of the crowd. Does that make sense? So now, with multiple electrodes on the head, I can pick up an onset of a focal seizure. One little quadrant saying, Boston, and everyone else like, Ugh. <laughs> fair enough, makes sense? So more electrodes on the head, better resolution in time and space for that one word. And that helps me decide whether these are focal onset versus generalized onset, um, whether they evolve to become bilateral tonic-clonic or whether they just stay focal, what's going on? Does that make sense? I'm recording that electrical activity in the brain. This is that chihuahua. The line moving across the screen matches the video. Those VPCs you're seeing, they're occurring in all of the traces, left and right side, at the same time. And they're time locked to either nose twitches or nothing. This dog is having generalized seizures on camera and we can't see a thing. There, nose twitches with that one. See it? You're reading an EEG right now. That's how I train the text. Flat is good, VPC is bad. <laughs> okay? And it's absolutely terrifying. There, little head twitch there. Absolutely terrifying to think that we recorded for eight hours. And if I were to play the audio on this clip, there's me blithely talking to the owner. No, sorry, we haven't seen any hiccups. It's, he's been here eight hours. You might as well come and get him. And then we reviewed this later and was like, oops. <laughs> Generalized absent seizures with myoclonic jerks in a chihuahua. This was the first ever recorded and published case in the dog and published in 2010. Okay, relatively new concept. 
So uses of EEG, diagnosis of epilepsy and other intracranial disorders. So we can distinguish epilepsy from uh, hepatic encephalopathy, for example, or hypoglycemia, things like that, that might be intermittent and episodic. Um, lo localization of the seizure focus, that brings into possibility the option of potentially seizure surgery. Can we take out the bad bit of brain and maybe reduce these dogs' re um, reliance on uh, drugs? Monitoring ICU patients, monitoring the depth of anesthesia, plenty of other uses as well. But of course, I know what I'm most interested in. Ha! Huh, treatment of focal or absent seizures. Until this point, we had them all in the same box as the generalized seizures. In humans, that doesn't work. There's focal or absence epilepsy syndromes in humans that get worse with phenobob. Think about that. We're not even there yet. We are so not there. I can't actually answer this question for you yet. Okay? So for cases two and three, we actually just put them on phenobob. And luckily enough, it worked. The chihuahua responded to phenobob, and by 18 months, he was seizure-free. And by two years, he was off his phenobob. It was a juvenile onset remitting epilepsy. He grew out of it. Children do that, too. Um, the twitchy uh, shepherd um, was uh, reduced in frequency, but not perfect, um, but sufficient for quality of life that the uh, family was uh, happy with. Loading. Not a lot of evidence for this to or for and against this either. But loading is when you start a drug at a higher dose, and, and the, the true meaning of loading means starting a drug at a high enough dose that by the time you're done that dosing regimen, that initial dosing regimen, they are at steady state in terms of their therapeutic levels. Um, it tends to turn them, if you're doing this with phenobarb or bromide, it tends to turn them into ornamental floor mats. I'm sure you've done it. Um, they forget to eat, drink, and they just pee all over themselves. A bit like marijuana intoxication, really. Um, so I don't tend to recommend it as an immediate, but I will do partial loading, where I might spread phenobarb Q8, say, over several days, just to get them up a little faster. Does that make sense? Um, no evidence. This is sort of evidence level four, expert opinion. Okay. Um, and uh, if you have other questions about that, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. Moving on, case four. Four-year-old male neutered border collie times Australian shepherd. Good combination of genetics there. Uh, he's been having generalized tonic-clonic seizures since he was one and a half years of age. He's a tier two idiopathic genetic epileptic. So we have scanned him and tapped him, and there was nothing that we could find, okay? On top of your routine uh, minimum database. He's currently on phenobarb, bromide, and levetiracetam. And I'm just going to mention why we care about genetic epilepsy. Because the more we look into these syndromes, the more information we're getting on prognostics for your owners. And he's an Australian Shepherd times a Border Collie. That doesn't look good based on this. Australian Shepherd's severe, poor seizure control, not related to ABCB1 mutation, early death, Border Collie's median survival time two years from index seizure. Not looking good, okay? Just a word here about genetics. ABCB1, that's the same gene as the MDR1 mutation. Okay? MDR1, ABCB1 is the gene for the um, P glycoprotein that removes drugs from the inside the blood brain barrier out. It's the, it's the bailing okay, mechanism. So, in some breeds, uh, collies and border collies, having the mutation means that they are potentially um, more responsive to their drugs or they are less sedated by the drugs. Make sense? And this is where we enter the era of personalized medicine. Because if you had an Australian shepherd, sorry, a, board, uh, sorry, a collie, and you determined that it was homozygous for the ABCB1 mutation, you could then tell them that this dog will actually have fewer seizures and less sedation on the drugs you're about to prescribe. Okay, this is personalized genetic medicine. Um, same with the border collies. Mutation means that they will respond better to the drugs. The epileptics, which is good because they have a really poor survival time from um, index seizure. Okay, so back to our little friend. This is how he presented.
bilateral and independent. See that? Facial myoclonus. He's still conscious, still aware, but both sides, both hemispheres are firing at this point independently. So what do we do about this? What do we call it? Question. Yes. Twitching ever be non-seizure? Yes. So the question is, can twitching ever be non-seizure? And is the only way you can tell the difference via EEG? The only way to truly diagnose what these are is EEG. Hands down, on the table. Um, this guy did get an EEG, so he's actually tier three. Um, the, uh, there are other causes of this. So if this was a she who'd had puppies the other day, I'd be concerned about hypocalcemia, for example, right? Um, if this was an islet cell tumor in the pancreas, I'd be concerned about hypoglycemia. So I can think of, if, he, if this one had cleaned out the organophosphates in the garage, <laughs> I'd also be concerned. Okay, so I can think of a few others, yes? I've seen something like that in case under general anesthesia. So could they be having a seizure when they're under general anesthesia? Like they're intubated and their face is twitching? So the question is, could this be, so this has been seen uh, in intubated patients under general anesthesia, could this be a seizure? That I cannot give you a clear answer on without an EEG because there are some drugs that do end up making them a bit twitchy um, and certainly for example dexmedetomidine they get these funny little jerks and I'm that one I'm pretty sure are not seizures because I sedate a lot of the uh, recalcitrant dogs with dexmedetomidine in order to put the electrodes on um, and then I record as they wake up so I'm recording through all those little twitches um, and those are not seizures um, but there are some debates as to whether the propofol twitches are seizures or not and I haven't recorded enough of those to tell you the answer to that okay um, so let's unpack this case drug resistant epilepsy He's on pheno, bromide, and Keppra, and he presents doing that. Let's talk about what that means. We used to call this refractory epilepsy. Um, the term that we are now recommending is resistant versus not tolerated. It gives us a bit a better clarity. Um, you could say idiopathic epilepsy, phenobarbital not tolerated. In other words, the liver packed it in, and now we've given up on that. Um, or you could say, um, idiopathic epilepsy, levetiracetam resistant. We tried levetiracetam all the way up to max dose. He got drunk, it didn't work, he still kept having seizures, right? That's a, a lot packed into a small description. Um, for humans, the actual definition, that's where the aster double asterisk is, is lack of seizure freedom to two drugs uh, or more. Um, but I don't think we have that as clearly um, identified for our, ourselves. Um, and quality of life compromised by seizure severity or frequency or medication adverse effects. In other words, maybe it would have worked, only it, the, 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 how stoned he was or the ataxia was just not tolerable, and so the owners weren't going to go there. Outcomes then, um, when we describe um, what we're looking for, we say, as I said, resistant to this XYZ drugs or not tolerating XYZ drugs, and a reported remission rate um, across genetic epileptics of about 15 to 30% who go into seizure-free remission. Like I said, you see them, I don't. The least likely to do that are Border Collies, German Shepherds, and Staffies. Back to our case number four, he's kind of hooped. Um, and if they've been seizure-free for one or two years, you could actually consider trying to wean the drugs, okay? which would be awesome for many owners. Back to our friend, um, one thing we would consider adding is given that his history is generalized tonic-clonic seizures, and now these are not generalized tonic-clonic seizures, these are sort of disconnected little twitches, we could consider adding a cluster buster therapy for him, okay? So uh, diazepam per rectum, zero, 20, and 40 minutes 
after onset of seizures to maintain serum levels up for about an hour based on the pharmacokinetics. And then extra doses of phenobarbital bromide and levetiracetam. I mean, he's going to be stoned. He'll sleep it off for 24 hours. And hopefully that's as bad as he gets. That's, that's a reasonable thing to do for him. Does that make sense? Okay, that's level four expert opinion. So weaknesses in looking at these genetic um, epileptics is that most of the studies in genetic epilepsy have been done outside of North America. Our colleagues in Europe seem to be much better at getting breed clubs together to understand these things. So it's something I think we could work on the side of the ditch. Um, there are no breed specific treatment recommendations yet. And that comes back to what I said about focal and absence epilepsies. We've all been treating them as one type of seizure, you know, one type of epilepsy before. And I think now that we can start to spread them apart, we can start to tailor the medicine to the type of seizure they're having, okay? And there's few genetic tests to identify these genetic epileptics yet. I'm gonna to speak to those two here with Rhodesian Ridgebacks. It's a study that I was part of that was published just earlier this year in the summer these dogs were identified by my colleague in Germany. They presented for doing this. And there was breed buy-in. And over the space of a couple of months, we EEG'd a bunch of them. We identified an absence myoclonic seizure phenotype, some of whom went on to have generalized tonic-clonic seizures, approximately a third. Age of onset at six months with a range of six weeks to one and a half years. And because we clearly phenotyped them and we had breed buy-in from identification to publication of three years, a gene genetic mutation for this type of epilepsy, the test is available on mydogdna.com. We don't know how far it's penetrated into the North American gene pool in the Rhodesians, because this research was done in Europe. But, at least in Europe, there are pretty much no more litters being born with this problem. First discovered in 2013, and in 2017, we're done. That's awesome. Uh, and that's buy-in, and that's the future, I think, of genetic epilepsy. The other thing is, we noticed that these dogs seem to respond really well to levetiracetam, not to phenobarb or KBR. So you want to talk about specific medication as well. That's the direction we're going in. This is my message of hope to you, that we can be very personal in our diagnoses and treatment for these patients. So, case five. Let's do a cat. Last case, okay, thank you for your attention so far. Three-year-old male neutered domestic short hair. Four-day progressive beha episodic behavioral changes. Hiding more generally, but now meowing and running around episodically and maybe drooling a bit. This is what he looked like in the exam room. There, see the change in his demeanor suddenly? Whiskers forward, mouth open, drooling, pupils dilated, and he, you can't hear him, but he's making that awful cat row noise that they make, upset cat noise. And he's back. Pupils are smaller, he's more relaxed, whiskers are back. Did you miss it? He's gonna do it again, just wait. Now he's just angry about the bandage. Comes around the corner and does it again. Eyes dilated, drooling. And watch those pupils. There's the meow, and then he relaxes and comes back again. There he is, whiskers back again. And he's angry about the bandage again. And here he does it again, frozen and off again. I kept missing it. Here he is, mid-seizure, mid eyes dilated, drooling, the meow, and he's done. Okay? And these are happening faster and faster and faster and faster until the point where there is no gap between them. 
We put him in the MRI, and there is a very subtle difference between the top image and the bottom image. The top image is what we call a T1 pre-contrast. The bottom in image is a T1 post-contrast. The difference between the two is an IV injection of a contrast agent that should not be seen in the brain other than in the blood vessels down the midline. Can you see that, where they're bright before and after? And if you look very carefully, and I'll just point here, here, compared to the same spot above, there's just the faintest blush of brightness in the brain parenchyma at that site. Can you appreciate that? Subtle difference. That's what you need a high Tesla for. That is the hippocampus that he has on bilateral contrast enhancement. In cats, about 40% of them have genetic idiopathic epilepsy. So those are the ones having seizures for fun. It's not primary or genetic epilepsy if they present in status epilepticus, if they're more than seven years of age, or if they have an abnormal interictal neuro exam. About 11% of cats will have something called hippocampal necrosis, and this is associated with orofacial signs that you were seeing, absences, the blanking, um, and they often present with an acute cluster. So with our little friend, we have two diagnoses. One is a cluster that rapidly is becoming status epilepticus. And two is hippocampal necrosis based on the MRI. CSF was, not, was fine, not inflammatory. So this is a non-inflammatory dying off of neurons in that area. We don't know why. Status epilepticus. This is five minutes of seizure, continuous seizure activity or two or more seizures with incomplete recovery. We used to say 20 or 30 minutes, but that's no good anymore because if we had people wait that long, by the time they showed up on your doorstep, they would be in trouble. So we say five minutes, humans as well, five minutes. They time it. At five, they put them on a duvet, drag them to the car, and find you, the closest clinic, and you insert diazepam as fast as you can. So it's caused by a failure of seizure termination or by the initiation of mechanisms within the brain that result in abnormally prolonged seizures. Think of it as the stadium turning into a riot. Okay? Somebody pulled the fire alarm. Um, this chart here shows you uh, two time frames with regards to status that are important to note. The first time, T1, is when those mechanisms kick in, that means that it's going to be hard for them to shut the seizure off. And T2 is when permanent damage is likely to start occurring. So five minutes, and by 30 minutes, their brain is starting to fry. For focal status, 10 minutes, and this is humans now, 10 minutes, and more than 60 minutes before they're starting to make permanent damage to their brain. So focal status, not so bad as generalized status. And then for absence status, after about 10 to 15 minutes, and Lord knows how long for damage to occur, and, and like I said, this is from humans, we don't even have those definitions in dogs. We're still working on that, okay? But I just want you to be aware of it. Now that you're aware of focal and absence types of seizures, just be aware of these time frames brought to us from the human side. This is where levetiracetam gets interesting, because as an adjunctive therapy in um, idiopathic epilepsy. Levetiracetam was equivalent to placebo in a blinded randomized control study with low N, for what that's worth, okay? But in a double blind randomized control study, IV levetiracetam was superior to placebo for controlling status epilepticus. The bonus here is that it doesn't sedate them. So you can monitor their mentation having controlled their seizures. Everything else we give them, diazepam, phenobarb, will knock them out. Propofol will knock them out. But levetiracetam will not do that. The problem is we don't have it here, unless you order it from Chiron or Summit. And it's sort of worth its weight in gold, that little vial of liquid. <laughs> um, and every year I go down to the pharmacy here and say, so can we order it yet? And they're like, no, we probably won't sell it fast enough. And then we'll have to start pouring that liquid gold down the drain. And then we don't order it. So 
if you were working in the States, you'd have access to it. And the price is coming down every year. So sooner or later, we will be able to afford it. And it will be a wonderful drug to use in our status cases. Um, am I missing something? <laughs> One second. Um, and then uh, for porter systemic shunt seizures, I'm just going to throw this in. Um, it is uh, useful for reducing the risk of post-surgery seizures. Does that make sense? Um, so if you start them on the levetiracetam a week or two prior to the seizure, uh, sorry, blah, blah, prior to the surgery, they are less likely to have seizures after the surgery. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, and then the other factoid I just want to remind you of is that when they are, have been on pheno chronically, they will clear the levetiracetam out of the body much faster than if they've not been on pheno. So you're gonna need a higher dose than what we typically use. So 20 mg per kg Q8 is where I start for the naive dog. You might need to hit 30 or 40 or 50 mg per kg Q8 for the um, pheno associated dog. The other meds I'm gonna mention here as add-ons are the gabapentin pregabalin. Um, there's some evidence to suggest them as effective add-ons. Um, they have minimal adverse effects, also not very sedating unless you hit like 10 times the dose, which you're not going there. Um, and uh, a fairly quick half-life, so fairly quick um, efficacious in dogs and cats. And as a rule of thumb, I don't know about you guys, but I suck at estimating dog weights. So I'm very much large dog, three mils. This is IV. If you have a good tech, you can hold one limb still and get an IV access quickly. And that, this, this injection should buy you time, I, I swear, that was not me, uh, buy you time to uh, get a catheter in and keep going. But large dog, three mils, small dog, uh, one mil, for example, toy dog or cat, half mil, double it per rectum. Um, and that's the rule of thumb I use. Um, I'm sort of large dog being golden and toy dog being teacup chihuahua sort of thing. Uh, for status epilepticus, I start with diazepam boluses. After about three, I give up as useless and go for the CRI. And then uh, if that's still uh, having breakthrough seizures, I add phenobarbital IV, either as bolus or CRI. Uh, and then I reach for anesthetics, so propofol or inhalant, depending on what you have. Uh, at this point, you're also committed to not going home uh, and or you've lost a tech for the day monitoring the GA that you've induced, also known as a medically induced coma. Um, so your day is pretty much looking horrible. Um, but uh, like I said, intubation, general anesthesia monitoring tends to cost a lot. Um, not a lot of people necessarily go there. Um, and I use the doses that Carol Matthews has in her, have, uh, has in her manual, um, very helpful. Uh, there's a lovely flow sheet available in the 2017 um, Journal of Veterinary Emergency and Critical Care um, that essentially says what I just said um, in more complicated graphical form. So back to case five. We put this young fellow on, so he came in, uh, we put him on phenobarbital levetiracetam, started diazepam CRI, that wasn't working, put him on a propofol CRI, um, added a tube with zonisamide and gabapentin, and this was the EEG we got. So you, here the line is not as clearly visible, but it matches what the video is showing you. And what you can see is the fairly flat line is becoming thicker and more staticky looking. See how the fuzz on each line is getting thicker and next screen it'll be even thicker see that those are all little spikes his brain is cooking it's a generalized seizure and this is him on all those drugs I listed not winning every time we brought him up this is what his brain would do we'd knock him back out and after about 48 hours of propofol they start to get Heinz body anemia so we weren't winning on that score either and the owners having given it a good old college try, um, elected euthanasia, not wrongly. Um, they also very, very kindly allowed us to take a look afterwards. And we were able to confirm the hippocampal necrosis um, that we saw on MRI. I have two cats where I have EEG and imaging findings correlated. Three makes a case series and I will publish at that point. Um, this has not been, the EEG associate with hippocampal necrosis in cats has not been published at this point. And this is him, the seizure coming back down again um, and going away. Okay, yes. 
So we don't, the question is why did they get hippocampal necrosis? The answer is we don't know. Um, we don't know if that is the result of the, the frequent and almost continuous seizure activity or whether that is the cause of the frequent and um, continuous seizure activity. In humans, the equivalent would be the mesial temporal lobe sclerosis that you can see in temporal lobe epilepsy. So uh, again, there they don't know if one is the cause and one is the uh, result so much. Um, but it's interesting to note that the cats and humans have very similar manifestations this way. So I'm just going to put this last terrifying thought on the table for you before you go home tonight. This is what keeps me awake at night. I'm going to share it with you. That is non-convulsive status epilepticus. Because if you noticed in that video, the cat was lying there. And if we didn't have the EEG on him, we would not have known, as we brought him up and down on the drugs, whether we were making a lick of difference. And so I have to wonder, looking back, before we routinely did EEG on more things than we do now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> whether, uh, this is a sign. This is, this is almost the last slide, okay? Um, but whether or not um, their brains are cooking on the inside. And the only way to know, the only way to diagnose non-convulsive status epilepticus is um, with an EEG. Um, so no outward clinical signs of seizure activity. And with that EEG, we call it electromechanical dissociation. And it can occur when there's been prolonged status epilepticus. So after a few hours of doing this, the, the motor activity goes away and you're like, yay, but really no. Um, and also when you've given enough drugs to stop that motor activity and you're like, yay, but really no, because the brain is still cooking on the inside. Absolutely terrifying, keeps me awake at night because that's when permanent brain damage will occur. Um, and you get into that self-fulfilling loop, uh, which means that you're not winning. Um, so back to our little friend, like I said, uh, not winning, um, the owners very kindly allowed us to have a look and we confirmed the hippocampal necrosis. So take home message, um, <laughs> we have a poltergeist in the room now, um, if, <laughs> if we're all speaking the same language with respect to epilepsy. Um, I think that will help us all uh, communicate. This should hopefully explain to you a lot of the words we're using in our discharge statements now um, and uh, looking to make um, comparisons between what our pets are doing, what humans with the same condition are doing, what can we learn from them and what can we teach them. Um, the biggest question we face is, is it a seizure? Um, and the best answer for that, unfortunately, is EEG. Um, the uh, future is in genetic testing. Um, as uh, that comes online, I think you will see more and more personalized medicine uh, for our patients. Um, and then as the evidence gets stronger, as we start to delineate different epilepsy syndromes, um, we will be able to tailor the treatment to the diagnosis that we make. Um, and that's what gives me hope. Any questions at this point? Yes. What does an EEG cost? Um, there's the appointment fee. Um, uh, a short, so less than two hours, we're charging about 250. Um, up to 24 hours, we're charging uh, 485, so the cost of an abdominal ultrasound. Um, plus, if they're staying the night, we have to put them somewhere, so there's that cost. Um, one in five dogs needs some chemical assistance to allow us to place the electrodes on the head. Um, the big dogs seem to bother less, the smaller dogs take it personally. Um, and then we have to use a lot of sticking plaster to, to, to attach it all and that they sometimes take a little personally as well. Uh, but then we wake them up and we let them do their thing in a crate with the camera on them uh, for as long as we need to and we present triggers if we can. One trigger that we do try to encourage is sleep um, because like I said, seizures occur best when the brain is sleepy. Um, and so if we don't even see a seizure, we might see interictal activity while they're napping. Um, so I have parked an owner and a dog in a room with the equipment and said, See you in three hours. <laughs> and, and funnily enough, there are people who are just determined to figure out what this is and they will do it. Uh, they bring their coffee and a, and a cell phone. Most dogs, actually. The moment you pull the cell phone out, they're like, oh. And they'll just go curl up and have a nap while you're like, they're smart, okay? And that's really helpful for us. Um, does that answer that question? Okay. Any other questions? No? I'd like to say thank you again to our sponsors. 
Uh, we have a little thank you gift for our sponsors, Andrea and Debbie. Just a little souvenir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your attention.